Joining us now, one of my absolute favorite people on the planet. That's a pretty big, that's a pretty big kudo. kudos to <laughs> Pat Buchanan. Hi, Pat. How are you? Good to talk to you, Laura. Thank you. So we've, uh, we've gone low. You know, Michelle Obama says, when they go low, we go high. That's her favorite phrase. How, uh, how low has this gone, Pat? Oh, it's appalling. Squalid. I mean, all of this talk for a Supreme Court justice about a Supreme Court justice and what the judge went through last night, it was anguishing, quite frankly, to see him go through that. And I agree with Mitch McConnell. Look, they've given uh, Ms. Ford or Professor Ford all the opportunity in the world to come and testify, and now she's been offered Thursday. And I have your same suspicion that she may not want to testify and they may try to delay it again, in which case I would go with the McConnell rule and just simply go ahead and vote uh, for Judge Kavanaugh and get it up right now. Well, I also heard the White House today with Sarah Huckabee Sanders saying, well, we believe that Deborah Ramirez, uh, you know, we're, we're open to having her heard. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Pat, this is, this is like death by a thousand cuts here. It, well, it, that's why? Absurd, I think. It's crazy. I think the Deborah Ramirez thing is crazy. She, I mean, there's, she doesn't have anybody corroborating what she said at all, and even the New York Times was reluctant to go into that story because it was so gauzy. And all you have to do is, with uh, with um, Judge Kavanaugh, just ask him, do you know this woman, et cetera, and, and answer the questions. But do the hearing on Thursday, get it over with, and vote. I mean, are we going to wait for Avenatti to bring in his uh, his victim as well? Well, the problem is, is you have these squirrely Republicans who are being besieged by protesters. Apparently, the Capitol Hill police cannot keep protesters out of the U.S. Capitol. I'd shut the whole thing down. I'd say, I'd say this, is a, this is a security risk at this point. Cannot have people uh, banging pots and pans outside of someone's office in the middle of a work day. Uh, but, you know, they're showing up with all pre-printed T-shirts, be a hero, outside of uh, Collins' office. And Collins now uh, apparently is... is Again, according to my sources, is was was totally solid two days ago, and now is wavering. I don't know what changed your mind in the last two days, but I agree with you on these demonstrators. You know, I testified for five hours before the Watergate committee, and there was an audience there. But they didn't behave like this at all during those Watergate hearings. And the idea that this is a this is real democracy in action when you got people yelling at congressional hearings. And, and and that these folks can march through the halls of the Congress of the United States, I think they're going to have to deal with it because I can tell you, watching it on television, all those people screaming and being dragged out uh, is dragging down the reputation of the entire democratic system. Yeah, I mean, if you're someone from another country and you're kind of watching this, how the economy is playing out and Trump seems to be doing some good things, but then you see this, right? it doesn't you know, make, it's, they look it's like orderly. Time. Yeah, they have fist fights in the Taiwan legislature, and I think similar things in Kiev. But this is the United States of America, the Great Republic, and you got this kind of nonsense going on. And really, they, I mean, people use this term loosely, fascist tactics, but that's exactly what the fascists did: is disrupt proceedings, democratic proceedings, and and make them all ridiculous and divide the country that way. And. And I really agree with you that the, uh, the the folks who run both houses of Congress ought to sit down, Democrats and Republicans, and say, what are we going to do about this? Well, and again, it, as this is happening, Pat, uh, very interestingly, the approval rating for the Republican Party, according to Gallup yesterday, reached like a seven-year high. I guess it's as compared to the Democrats. They're up one point. It's 45 to 44. It's gone up seven points. Well, this is um, amazing. I read the yeah. same, saw the same thing that the numbers, of course, it's a, it, it, it indicates, I think, maybe the fact that independents are making their decisions as to which party they'd like to support. And, but that's extraordinarily high for the Republican Party, given all the, the attacks on Trump and all the controversies involved and the fact they've been in almost two years. And obviously the... the the generic polls of how they're going to vote in November lean toward the Democrats. But I was, you know, pleasantly surprised with that and uh, and found it rather remarkable that uh, Republicans had parity with the Democratic Party. And Pat, isn't it also the case that 
there's a sense of fairness that is just seems to be missing here. I think the Democrats thought that, oh, okay, we get these w- w- protesters, Every, all the women are going to rally to us because this is so, this is a woman's issue. But women have sons and husbands and brothers, and I think I think people are petrified of where this goes for our country. I really think outside of the activist base. I think just a general sense of fairness. I want to play something from Chris Coons because it it dovetails into what I'm talking about, about where the presumption should be uh, of guilt or innocence in a proceeding such as this. Let's listen. It is Judge Kavanaugh who is seeking a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court uh, and who I think now bears the burden of disproving these allegations uh, rather than uh, Dr. Ford and Ms. Ramirez, um, who should be dismissed um, with slanderous accusations. Pat. <laughs> the presumption of guilt. The accusation equals guilt. I mean, that's, uh, that is really preposterous. I do think this. In the culture, when the, the uh, Professor Ford first made the first allegations came out, people said, this is serious. Something happened to this woman. She's got a right to be heard. And then the constant, you know, tactical moves to put off the date for testifying, the demands for not only for the FBI investigation, but that Kavanaugh go first, and the accusation comes after the defense. All of this turning things upside down, I need to get a car to drive across the country when you wonder how she got to Hawaii in those days. So all of these things, I think, have... It has turned gradually to the point, I think, that there's a great amount of exasperation in the country in a sense, look, we've heard these accusations, you've had a chance to air them, you're going to have a chance in committee, now get it over with and do it. In other words, there's a frustration, I think, with the delays being put on this process by the Democrats and by the constant accusations and by the charges that that Kavanaugh's got to prove his innocence, that his guilt doesn't have to be established. We're talking to Pat Buchanan here on The Laura Ingram Show. And, Pat, as all of this is happening, this drama surrounding Rod Rosenstein, who's the deputy attorney general, also swirling with this rank speculation that on Thursday he'll be fired. There's a big showdown at the OK Corral on Thursday where he's... (laughs) He's going to make his way up to the White House. They had they had the cameras on the Justice Department and the West Executive Ave, Pat, like it was the O.J. you know White Bronco chase yesterday. It was crazy. <laughs> well, listen, I think if uh, you know, I was on TV the other day, and I said, "Look, if this guy talked seriously about wearing a wire into the Oval Office and going and talking to the Cabinet about invoking the Twenty Fifth Amendment, he is certifiable." I'm inclined to agree, to believe that they were all discussing nonsense about Trump, and he said this sarcastically. But I do think this. I think Trump ought to hold off any action on the Justice Department until after the election now. We're too close to that. And after the election, I think you ought to make his move. I mean, I'm an admirer of Jeff Sessions, but if he wants a new man, that's the time to get a new man, a new man at the entire top of the Justice Department. Yeah, it's a, it's a dysfunctional relationship but you know anything trump does are going to say is a constitution everything's a constitutional crisis and for enforcing the border is a constitutional crisis actually you know getting people deported out of the country that's that, that breaks tears at the fabric of 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 who we are and lady liberty is crying and you know it's always the emotional pull but you know this is one of the things reasons that uh, trump is admired i mean he's looking at a situation where people are howling and screaming and say you can't do this and he steps up and does it. I'm not saying he's always right, but he is decisive. And that's what we see in this hearings now, is this indecisiveness on the part of the Republicans. Oh, my God, they got another charge. We're going to have to hear that, et cetera. I mean, set the deadline and vote and take the consequences of this. And again, I say it's, it's a quality of Trump that I think is admirable, and it's, it's clear-cut, I mean, it's... it's it's conviction. He may not have all the facts right, but it's conviction and action. No, and uh, by the way, I want to play. I wasn't going to play this, but I think it's it's a little bit off topic, but it goes to the issue that you and I care about so much, which is um, making sure that immigration in our country is done in a way that allows people to assimilate and understand our values and so forth. This was Jeb Bush. Uh, James, let's play both of them, okay? Put, we'll put one with two because there are two sound bites. Okay, th- Jeb Bush was giving an interview to, um, I think it was Jay Nordlinger uh, at National Review. It was a podcast, and he made some comments about the country and changing demography. 
and he might have been talking about yours truly at some point, but let's listen. Our party um, is advocating restricting legal immigration as well, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's foolhardy beyond belief, but you know, there's a way to reform the, the uh, legal immigration system that would be it would be a catalyst for sustained economic growth, and we need it because our demography's um, going going the wrong way. There are quite a few people that have a larger megaphone, if you will, that um, see you know either threatened by what they perceive to be a changing country that is uh, you know less less white, perhaps I don't know. I mean, it's um, there's. Basically, there's a concern that we've lost our way, and immigrants are, are easy to kind of single out um, with, uh, you know, with, with vitriol. It's shocking that he didn't win the nomination, Pat. <laughs> well, he, he sounds like a fellow who's walking through a minefield very gingerly. <laughs> I wonder what he meant when he said demography is going the wrong way. That mm -hmm. He's going to be up on charges for that. But here's the problem with the... With the, what, one of the problems with the immigration that doesn't get enough attention is the melting pot that works so well when all the Irish and the Jews and the Italians and the Polish folks and the Slovakians and the others came from 1890 to 1920. They got into first grade. It was, they taught in, in kindergarten and first grade. They're taught in English. The whole melting pot basically made us, welded us all into these new folks, the Americans. The trouble is the melting pot is dead. People come in and they're told, maintain your own language, your own religion, your own customs, your own separate traditions from your host country. That's what we're all about. We're not a melting pot anymore. It's like if someone wrote a giant stew where certain elements of it, it's more and more difficult in order to bring all these things together into one. And so that we have no unity, and there. And the key question that you want in your country is is not so much diversity, but diversity that, is, that brings about a, ultimately a unity of one nation and one people. And we're not becoming that. I mean, how can you have one people when you got two hundred languages or something taught in your public schools, and people are told to maintain the language you brought here? I mean, you got to find the things that make us one nation, one people. But folks don't believe that. And this is the problem to me, the whole thing with diversity. I look around, I wrote that column on on, uh, on diversity. Diversity is ripping countries apart in Europe and China and all over the world. And because people are not assimilating and they don't communicate and they're not becoming one nation. And Pat, where are we going? Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a, what's wisely, of course, put in Pat. I got to go now because I got to go through all those old Gonzaga conduct and behavior files of the Buchanan boys. I'm, I need to. I need to. I need to. I got to make sure. I got to go back. I think there was a beer party somewhere, and someone someone threw some some someone threw something through a window once at Gonzaga, and he got smacked in the head by one of the priests. Pat Buchanan, oh, it was always great having you on. Thank you so much for your analysis.